Good morning to everybody um, and welcome to today's um, webinar entitled How to Be a Good Trial Manager. Uh, my name's um, Anna Griffiths. I'm a clinical project manager at the MRC CTU at UCL in London. Um, this webinar is brought to you by the MRC CTU at UCL and the Global Health Network. It's the second in a series of, of webinars. This series is focusing on different roles um, within clinical trials. Um, so just after this uh, short welcome, um, today we'll be joined by a panel of four experienced trial managers um, from Africa, Asia and Europe who will be sharing their valuable insights, personal experiences and top tips on being a good trial manager before we move to a panel discussion and a Q&A. So we're joined today by Eni Chidziva from the University of Zimbabwe's Clinical Research Centre, uh, Peter Scatori uh, from the MRC CTU at UCL, uh, Nokalam from the University of Oxford's Clinical Trials Unit in, in Vietnam, and Nazia Parker, who is from also from the MRC CTU at UCL. Um, so just before we get started, uh, I'm just going to run through some housekeeping. Firstly, to say that this session is being recorded. Uh, this recording will be shared in the coming weeks on the Global Health Network's platform. Um, so you can review and share the material. Uh, these materials can be found using a link that um, will be shared in the chat. And um, please use the chat feature to introduce yourselves or to report any technical issues you might be experiencing. And the Global Health Network team will be able to assist you with these. To interact with the panel, please use the Q&A feature. It's great to see that we've got so many people joining us, um, but due to the, the volume of participants, uh, your videos and microphones have been disabled. Um, so we will have some dedicated time at the end to do Q&A. Um, we imagine that there might be quite a number of questions, so we might not be able to get through all of them. Uh, but if we don't um, have time during the session, we will compile um, some answers and address these after the session okay and so um we'll begin today's program and firstly i would like to introduce our first panelist who is any chitziva um any has over 18 years experience managing clinical trials at the university of zimbabwe's clinical trials a clinical research center uh, she's currently leading a, a trial management team uh, in the efficient coordination of research studies in HIV and co-infections in, in children and adults. Um, and he joined UZCRC as a research nurse um, in 2002. Um, she became a trial manager in 2005 and then a site clinical trial manager in 2010. Prior to this, she's worked as a registered nurse in HIV and AIDS, and she discovered a passion for research and has worked as part of the team that conducted um, the DART study. Um, during her time at UZCRC, she's managed over 17 clinical trials, uh, mentored new clinical tri trial managers and set up new research sites within Zimbabwe. Um, she's still a registered general nurse and uh, has obtained an MSc in clinical trials from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, it's great to have you here with us today, Annie. So I'm going to hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you very much, Anna. I will just... So I'll quickly share. Okay. Um just I'll just start by um saying it's just such a pleasure to be able to share um our experiences at UZCRC of um having worked uh, in clinical trials. So I'll be sharing some of my experiences and experiences that I've gathered from our team. Um so um I can start by saying uh, a trial manager. Uh, in our experience, can have many roles, um, but the key goal is to keep the team together and keep it functional. Uh, the different units uh, in the team, your clinic, your pharmacy, your lab, and all the other stakeholders that make that trial function. So you are at the center of communication. You're a communications officer, you are a teacher, trainer, a facilitator. And uh, sometimes a mediator, you are called upon to mediate sometimes in terms of conflict. You are an advocate, you want to make sure that um, you are adhering to uh, um, protecting rights of participants, uh, the ethics, ethical standards of the organization are being maintained. 
you are also your own internal monitor for the, uh, monitor for the site and auditor you are a role model the team is watching how you perform your work how you handle yourself um and already you are the site ambassador you can be called upon to represent your site um for at different platforms and uh, you need to be ready um and also you need to be somebody who is approachable and friendly so that people can come to you to share information or raise alarm with any issues or challenges that um, could be availed. So just moving on to some of the challenges that I can quickly share um, and some of the mitigations or action plans that we found useful. Uh, pressure of work, uh, especially if you're working across studies is, uh, is the norm these days that you can work more than one clinical trial and have various teams working. So it's important to plan and prioritize and uh, identify focal people for different studies and activities. And your role as trial manager will be key in supporting those focal people so that they function and then you can meet your study timeline. Um, and also pro protocols with complicated procedures has been another challenge. And this will require regular refresher trainings but as trial manager, we found it useful to monitor data queries and any QC issues that develop so that you can come up with targeted training topics or sometimes target certain individuals to help them uh, where they may be facing challenges. And we found the use of case scenarios, uh, enhanced comprehension or even little dramas or little um, skits to mimic like a consenting process or a, a discussion process with teenagers about pregnancy so that the team does things that are fairly uniform and your message is one as, as a team. Um, challenges with missed uh, procedures, uh, that's just one example of a challenge that we found um, it helps to develop site tools with the team, work with the different departments to develop tools that help them to remember and also work on your SOPs together. Uh, come up with them and when things are not working, encourage the team to share that this is not working, then you can update that SOP real time. Um, we have come up with uh, tracking forms and checklists that help uh, the team to remember events and activities that we can put in each consulting room for people to reference. Uh, comp we, um, as a country, have a fairly complicated ethics and regulatory framework. So uh, to make sure that you don't uh, expire, um, your protocols remain valid and you remain uh, reg compliant, it's important to maintain contact with secretariats and develop um, good relationships with them and also develop tools that help you to remember uh, when to renew and visit websites regularly of those um, different ethics committees so that sometimes they will post things or new guidelines. It's important to stay up to date. And also we found that it is useful to participate in their activities, say when they are hosting research workshops or symposiums, take an active part, take an active role so that um, they know that um, you are supporting and they will in turn support you. Um, and some of the skills that we just listed that we think will be useful to develop or to grow, um, as we are all different, uh, I will put the first one, I put the first one as an ongoing risk-based approach, an ongoing risk-based mindset. Um, you want to be always looking at identifying um, issues that could go wrong and assess um, how, what would be the impact if this went wrong and then plan to mitigate or plan to avoid um, that happening. That way, every situation you look at, you'll be able to stay a step ahead of, um, of, of issues and also plan to always stay on top of situations. Um, you need to develop skills of reading and comprehension. Protocols are usually um, not written in lay language. So it's important to read and understand because you become the go-to person when people do not understand. Remember, you are the trainer or you're a facilitator with training. So it's important that you have understood um, so that when the team needs your help or you 
need to provide some leadership or guidance, you you are, you are fully comprehended, and um, you need to be bold and make decisions. Being um, a trial manager, I would say, is is not a popularity contest. Sometimes you are the person that is telling people to do things right, and sometimes you are not the most popular in the team, but you need to be bold and make decisions and remain friendly and calm. It's important to remain calm. Um, in communications, you are communicating with sponsors, you are communicating with local stakeholders, with uh, participants, and you're also communicating with your own team. So it's important that you develop listening uh, skills, um, good listening skills. You are observing, you're analyzing situations, and um, also that you are empathetic, especially with your team. It's important to get to know your team as individuals because some could be going through personal issues and you can step in to, to assist them uh, where, where you can or direct the assistance that they need, direct them towards the assistance that they need um, to keep um, the, the team more like a family unit. That's what we have over the years become, as you said, CRC, we've become more like a family unit because we've known each other for a while and attended each other's um, weddings or children's weddings or parties at ETC and also find opportunities to motivate the team. Uh, when we travel, we always make it a point when we travel for meetings to come back with chocolates. It goes a long way when you share those out with your team as even as you give them feedback about what happened uh, at whatever event you would have attended and also develop mentoring skills so that you can mentor the team around you. It certainly makes your work easier when people are able to now take on more roles and responsibilities. Um, and so I can say um, one top tip is just also maintain cordial relationships with your team and with your stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks so much, Henny. Um, and we'll we'll do um, questions at the end once um, we've heard from all of our speakers. Um, so next today we are joined by Peter Scottori. Um, he is clinical trial manager at uh, MRCCTU at UCL. Uh, he's got a background in biomedical sciences uh, and immunology, um, and he's. Um, currently working on an uh, infectious disease trial, uh, looking at using novel combinations of antibiotics to treat neonatal sepsis in middle to low income countries. Um, he started his clinical research um, journey um, as, as a lab technician at a small science startup um, and has worked um, in clinical research for, for over 10 years with experience in um, respiratory disease, infectious diseases and cancer trials. So I'll just hand over to Peter. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Um, it's very nice to be here. So, yeah, just to start off, as Anna mentioned, um, I, I I, have a background in, um, I, I started uh, about, just about 10 years ago or a bit more than 10 years in the lab um, as a lab technician working at, you know, a CRO. And then I just wanted to mention that, you know, I, I I've always wanted to, I've always really enjoyed clinical trials and wanted to work here and like, you know, uh, work myself up to um, trial manager, which I've only been in the role now for about just over a year. So if anyone can relate and that's helpful, um, I always find that when I see other people that helps me. Um, I just wanted to say from personal experience that there's a lot to learn and a lot comes from experience. So it's just good to take your time. There's always something that's unknown. There's so many different things in trials. Um, I've done both commercial and academic and they can both differ, but they are ultimately the same at the end. Um, understanding how all parts of the trial work, like lab pharmacy um, or anything else. Again, I, 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 I'd say that from my background, I've seen that it's really helped, let's say that I started off from the, the lab, um, because it helps you ask the questions that um, someone else might not think. So. A piece of advice would maybe be to shadow someone or ask about experienced teams, you know, their day to day, see how they work, what they do, um, how things run there, different sites do different things. So it's, it's good to know and 
and figure out how you know what might come up for your trial <clears throat> um another piece of advice that i would give that i've i've had in, in my personal experience is um, using other successful trials as examples to adapt in your own trial, especially if you're in UTM. Um, so asking, let's say, for documentation from other trials, especially like, you know, if they've worked well, um, you can do that, adapt to your own trial. And it gives you an insight as well of like how they went, especially if it's a long uh, running trial. It, it really helps with, you know, understanding how um, you can do things. And again, how sites work, how PIs work, how you know, your unit might work. Um, <clears throat> so um, in my experience of observing other TMs um, uh, as, I've, as I've done this is that, um, and I'm sure everyone will agree that everyone works in different ways, um, but it's good to find the balance working with other team members, not just trial managers, like data managers, nurses, you know, project managers, and just support each other in your strengths and weaknesses. Everyone will do something differently. Um, and a big part of something that any mentioned too, and I'm sure my other colleagues will, is communication. Big part, be you know, be clear, talk to people. And like Ellen said, um, friendliness and kindness, I really think is key when talking to sites and collaborators. It's really helped me um, when, you know, you have overworked nurses, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and they really appreciate any support that they can get. Um, and I found that, you know, when you're kind, you give them some more time to do some things. If they've asked you, they they do support you back and they do help you. <clears throat> um, and also, because I've worked in some international trials, I would say respect different ways of working and other cultures. You will find from, you know, some countries work on days that you might not um, and times that you might not do something differently. And it's just good to be aware of that, respect that, and and help the team out there. Um, and finally, to just mention some some challenges that I've had and, and my experience with that is inexperienced sites might need a little bit more hand-holding. They might need a little bit more training, uh, maybe a few more monitoring visits, just to make sure that everything is done correctly. Um, and, you know, you get your experience sites that you might, you know, you could leave alone for a little while, but and help the inexperienced sites to grow. And then if you get to work with those inexperienced sites again, they're a lot more experienced and they know what to expect from you. And you do get a lot of good work and you can like help shape them and form them into a good, you know, a clinical trial site that can help in the future. Um, again, because of my background with international trials, um, International clinical trial regulations, just be aware, you know, you, we get used to the local ones, but working internationally, it's good to assess and check how many competent authorities might need to approve the trial. Like I've had surprises before. I worked in trials where we, we thought we knew everything that needed to be done. And then just another board comes up, another, you know, ethical committee that needs to check things. So I would say leave enough time to do this. Check with local sites, even if, you know, more than one, sometimes they might not get it right. Um, and just make sure that you do all your due diligence. Um, and just lastly, I wanted to mention that having multiple collaborators, sometimes everyone has their own vision of how the trial will run. Um, and so it's good to start off by agreeing with everyone what their responsibilities are. You know, your stakeholders, collaborators, everyone wants something different out of the trial. Um, and it's just good to agree or make sure that you're all working towards the same goal and if someone, you know, is seeing something differently, then you just, you know, work with them together with that and see what they want to get out of it. And you can adjust um, yourself as well. Um, my top tip would be that it's OK if you don't get everything correct from the beginning. You know, um, there are always ways to amend processes, protocols, approvals, um, unless, you know, something has gone horribly wrong. Um, you you can't always get it right from the beginning. There's always going to be surprises until you're like down in the field, in the hospital, at the site, seeing the team work, seeing different teams work. There's always going to be a surprise. I would say expect the unexpected um, and just, you know, things can be fixed. It's okay. You know, something goes wrong. Um, and that's all from me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Peter. Um, our next panelist um, today, 
um, is joining us from Vietnam, um, Nok Lam, um, and she is responsible for managing uh, operations and uh, the governance team to conduct clinical trials and observational studies at the University of Oxford's Clinical Trials Unit in um, Hanoi, Vietnam, and she's held that post since 2002. Uh, before that, uh, Nok was at the Okru Centre in Ho Chi Minh City, um, and she joined there in 2016 as a clinical trial, uh, clinical research coordinator, and then became a senior uh, research coordinator after two, two years. Um, she's led the TB meningitis clinical trial coordination activities and HIV clinical research. Um, and prior to this, um, she has a, a BSc in biology and an MSc in clinical trials from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you, Nock. Hello everyone. Uh, let me see. Let's share my screen. All right. Okay. Hello everyone. It's really nice to be here, and I want to say thank you to the organizers um, for inviting me to this really interesting um, webinar. And I also want to say thank you to all the audience that joining with us today. So my name is Ngoc, and I'm based in Vietnam. About my talk, so I will um. I will share with you some um, experience from my working time and also I will go first about the responsibility. Sorry, Anna. And the responsibility of a clinical trial manager and uh, some top tips for you guys. So, um, yeah, personally, I think that if we want to enhance our skills um, to be a good trial manager, firstly, we should uh, understand that about the role of a trial nature and the responsibility. So actually there are a lot of um, tasks and responsibility when being a trial manager, but I try to catch up the main, the main thing for me. So I want to share with you. The first one is about the um, oversight of the trial implementation activities. Um, yeah, we should have an over overall view of the trial activities to ensure it can run smoothly and identify the issue or the problem in a timely manner that we can give the solution in on time. And the second thing that um, we should ensure that the clinical trials meet the ethical and regulatory oversight. So it means that um, we should Ensure that the trial is running uh, well and aligned with the ethical standards, the regulations, um, and also it ensuring the patient safety and the ethic as well. So how how can we ensure the ethical and regulatory oversight of the clinical trials? Uh, we should keeping up to date the knowledge of the relevant relevant guidelines and the regulations to. Keep an eye on that and we update the knowledge and the information of the relevant guidelines. Um, the other thing that we should oversight for the study patient screening and recruitment to keep it track and also to ensure that it's in align with the study protocol and um, regulations. So um, how can we um, manage and uh, oversight of the trial implementation activities and the ethical and regulatory we should have the operational aspect review um, to develop the appropriate relevant procedural developments. So for example, the study SOP, the manual or the assessment plan for the study. And beside that, we should ensure that our clinical trial data should be um, oversight with the allied the regulatory um, check. And furthermore, so um, we should keep track on the study progress, as I mentioned, and also we should um, ensure that the trial docu document and materials are um, safely stored and well managed. The last um, two things, I put it in the last, but it's really important because I just want to um, um, offer on the things re regarding the operation, the regulations, the trial patients, um, recruitment. The other thing is the study budgets. It's really important that we should uh, manage the study budget uh, well and plan it from the beginning phase of the trial and keep on track and keep an eye on that um, during the ongoing phase and also the closing phase. 
And uh, you know that working in a trial, we will uh, have a big team from the study side, the admin, the finance, the pharmacy, every single contrib contribution to a, a big trial and um, successful trial. So we should be in a trial, should in and to ensuring the effective of the study team, to ensure that everything is going well and we keep uh, communicating with the team. So from that slide that I shared about the um, responsibility, but I want to share about uh, my personal experience and also the observed um, experience from other trial managers. So to me, yeah, there will be um, um, many experience from the other trial manager and will be different from each trial manager because we see a different um, clinical trial point of view. But to me, that I think that understanding the study document well is really important. So why is that? So we should um understand where the protocol or the procedure or the re relevant guidelines to build and develop the appropriate SOB and the manual on the assessment plan at the setup phase to ensure everything is aligned with the study protocol and to minimize the deviation and violation, which is we don't want to make that. And the other thing is about the being aware of and giving the training on the update relevant guidelines because you now we um living in the it the it was so we will update everything and very fast about the guidelines how to protect the patient data or how to conduct the clinical trial so it's been updated to ensure that we protect the patient and we ensure that the clinical trials is um meet the regulations so we should be aware of that and giving the training. Um, for the update regular relevant guidelines to the study team or the other members in the team. And as I mentioned before, that um, assessment plan is really important. So risk assessment plan is the thing that we can um, think about um, expected or unexpected issue that we can produce um, possible solution to solve it when we meet the issue or problem. And I recommend that we should work in a team to have a very general view point for the issue that we can find potential solution. And uh, communicating. So I agree with Andy and Bia that communication is really important. So communicating with the study team and stakeholder to um, keep everything in post information and we maintain the team. Study budget and study timeline is really important, so we should plan it well and to ensure the study budget is uh, appropriately spent and also in actual for the situation. And the study timeline, we should manage it and estimate for example the IRB submission because it will maybe take time for different local IRBs. And also the consumable orders or the study um, patient recruitment, so we should estimate and manage the study timeline to ensure everything is keep on track and we can identify the issue on time. Um, the last one is the balancing the overall and day-to-day -day management. So try to be overall to see the um, general point of view of the study and to identify the, the problem or try to um, identify issue at each stage, but also day-to-day -day management to keep everything running well. So that's the about the experience and yes, being a trial manager, we will have challenge. So the first one is the multiple tasks. So when I mentioned about everything, regulation, study participant, uh, recruitment, uh, study pharmacy or IRB, so all that task will not uh, happen in order. So it can happen at the same time. So we can be overwhelmed by the multiple tasks. And I will share the top tip later for the challenge. The second one is the BC side BI. So actually I experienced that and I feel that it will be a challenge when working in my trial. So a side BI can be a director of the hospital or vice director of hospital and being a BI for study or for investigator for the other studies. So of course they don't have enough time for, us, for our study. So trial managers should um, communicate more with the side BI to identify the thing and need to correct and to find the MC or how to ensure them the procedure of the trials. 
And the other thing is the different working cultures among the study sites. So a clinical trials when running in the Munti site, we will have um, many hospitals to join in as a study site. And each of the study site will have a working different in the working culture. So a trial manager should um more practical. So um be on the site and learn about um, the working culture as the site and we can develop the appropriate um, standard procedure to the site, but of course it will align with the study protocol. So to, to keep it um, aligned with the working culture, but to the study protocol. And um, as I mentioned about the study team, there will be um, many teams contribute to the trial. And yes, there will be some time we have the conflict, for example, the disagreement between the study team about the, the problem solving or the solution or anything and on the turnover staff. So the trial manager should keep the communication well to understand the team and to understand about the workload as well as the issue or problem that we can identify it in a timely manner and give a solution. And the other challenge is uh, keeping track of the study activity and budget. So try to keep track the study activities to ensure it's on plan and time and the budget is appropriately expensed. So top tips. So actually I have um a lot of top tips I want to share with you, but I want to shorten it and uh, to be easier to get it. So the first one is the communication. So communication to keep uh, the team up to date and understand the team, as I mentioned, as well as identify the problem and connect the team to ensure the trials running well. The second one is problem solving skill. So we should um, know about, uh, we should understand the um, the issue of the problem and we can have the decision making at the same time. But it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect on the problem solving. So if you don't know or you cannot give a solution for the problem, don't be afraid to talk and discuss and concern with the other team. So we can have them together have the solution that we can connect the team and solve the problem. And the last one is time management because there will be a lot of tasks happening at the same time. So we should manage our time well to balance the tasks of the study and to do the macro and micro management. And the last one to keep our mental health well because um spending time for the study, yes, for work, but should we should work life balance to keep our time for ourselves to have um effective work but effective life. So that's it on my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Thanks so much, Nock. Um, and then we'll go to our final uh, panelist of the day, uh, to Nazia Parker, um, who began her, her interest in clinical trials uh, while studying applied medical science at university and took on um, modules in clinical trials before deciding that this was going to be her uh, the pit career pathway that she was going to pursue. So after finishing university, she started at the uh, MRC CTU at UCL, firstly as a trials assistant and then subsequently as a data manager on uh, one of our large prostate cancer trials. Um, so after gaining some experience uh, through the data management role, um, she progressed to trial manager and is now working on a paediatric HIV study. Um, over to you, Nazia. Thank you, Anna. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're joining from in the world. Uh, I've had a look at the chat and there seems to be people joining from all over, which is really exciting. Um, and it's a pleasure to be part of this webinar. So thank you for having me. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Nazia and I work as a trial manager at the MRC CTU at UCL in the UK. And I work on a paediatric HIV trial called D3. I just wanted to give you a brief overview uh, to, of, as to what the D3 trial is, uh, so that it gives you a bit of context as to what my role entails. So D3 is a regulatory trial that's aiming to find out whether in children and young people, uh, taking a fixed dose combination of two antiretroviral therapies called dolitegravir and lamivudine, which together make DHG3 TC, has fewer side effects and works just as well as taking three antiretroviral therapies, which is what many children and young people currently take. 
The trial opened to recruitment in May 2022, and we have 16 sites in total, which are spread across five countries, including Uganda, South Africa, Thailand, the UK and Spain. And we have now fully recruited the trial. So in terms of what my role as a trial manager on D3 entails, uh, there are a wide, wide range of responsibilities I have, but I've tried to summarise the key ones. So these include writing and reviewing numerous trial documents, and this can include, but not limited to, patient information sheets and informed consent forms, the IMP management plan, safety management plan, and writing and reviewing reports. Uh, I've also been responsible for developing and reviewing worksheets and ECRFs, which are what we use to collect the data on, maintaining an electronic trial master file, which is where key trial documents are stored, delivering training sessions for sites, not just at the beginning of the trial, but also throughout the trial as new updates become available or just as refresher training, communicating with sites and responding to their queries, which depending on the nature of the query could be quite urgent, particularly if it regards safety or eligibility, obtaining regulatory and ethics approvals, which again isn't just at the beginning of the trial, but throughout as new updates and or documents become available. And having an international trial means you need to be aware of the requirements in each of those participating countries. Managing IMP, which involves a myriad of tasks, but can include creating the drug forecast, processing drug orders, liaising with the contract research organisation who's responsible for labelling and shipping the IMP, and then liaising with sites to manage these shipments and review documents received from them. Processing adverse events. So in D3, all adverse events are reportable. So as the trial manager, we're responsible for reviewing and processing these, conducting a MEDRA code review, and then informing the clinical reviewer within the required timelines. We're also responsible for compiling safety reports, such as the Development Safety Update Report, which is updated annually, conducting on-site monitoring visits to ensure that the sites are adhering to the protocol, and attending various trial meetings, which can range from smaller internal ones to larger external ones with sites or your collaborators. As you can see, there are quite a lot of responsibilities. And so from my own experience, as well as observing other trial managers, I would summarize the following as being some of the key skills required for being a good trial manager and managing these responsibilities. So number one would be time management and organization so that you can manage numerous responsibilities and priorities simultaneously and also keep track of all your tasks. But at the same time, I think it's important to be able to manage your stress and your workload. As D3 is a regulatory trial and we have numerous collaborators, it's often quite difficult to manage all the deadlines and there's often a high workload. But I think it's important to be honest with your line manager and colleagues about re readjusting these deadlines and priorities so that it can be more manageable for you. And it's also important to ensure that you try to limit your stress and the stress you inflict upon your colleagues uh, to prevent creating a negative working environment for them. It's important to have close attention to detail so that the information you're providing is accurate and so that you can spot any discrepancies. It's important to be able to work independently as often you'll be the sole person responsible for completing a task. However, there will also be some tasks that require a collaborative effort. So it's important to be able to communicate with your colleagues well and communicate clearly and respectfully to them, especially when you've got numerous different collaborators. It's important to have a good knowledge of the trial and the protocol so that you understand it well in its requirements and can answer any queries regarding it, but also so that you can spot if anything isn't being adhered to as it should be. And also having awareness of international regulatory and ethical requirements, uh, which is, of course, important when you're working on an international trial like D3. So I have gained an incredible amount of experience working on D3, but it has brought with it some challenges. So when I joined the trial, it was still in the process of being set up, and this had already been delayed due to COVID and other reasons. Uh, so there was quite an extra pressure for the trial to start. However, once we did start to open to recruitment, uh, we recruited very quickly and much quicker than we had anticipated, which brought with it extra workload and pressures to manage. Uh, D3 was also one of the first few trials in the unit to use the electronic data capture platform Open Clinica. Uh, so it was quite time consuming and difficult to set up. And it took a while to become familiar with it and understand the requirements of it. And one way we managed this was speaking to other trials in the unit that had already used Open Clinica or other trials that were in a similar position in setting it up so that we could troubleshoot problems together. You often have to 
manage numerous tasks on a daily basis. Uh, so it's important to manage all of these and conflicting priorities. And this ties in with working with different collaborators because you often have different responsibilities and requirements for each of them that need to be actioned, but sometimes these can be conflicting. Having international sites and managing these can also be quite tricky uh, because it can be difficult to keep on top of all of them and be aware of all their reporting requirements and keep on top of their approvals. It can also be challenging when you have unresponsive sites as well, especially if you require a query resolution quite urgently. I guess also in my personal experience, I found it quite challenging uh, moving to the trial manager role because, as Anna had mentioned, I was previously a data manager and I was working uh, on a cancer trial. So when I joined D3, I was not only adjusting to a new role, but also to a new disease area. Uh, so it took some time to become familiar with it. So I just wanted to summarise uh, and say that my top tip, I think, would be to manage your workload and stress. I know it is easier said than done, but I think it's important to be organised and keep a track of your responsibilities and deadlines. And as I said, discuss these with your line manager or your colleagues to see if these can be adjusted if you think any of these are unrealistic. And try to limit your stress and the stress that you unintentionally inflict upon your colleagues uh, just to create a more positive and pleasant working environment. Thank you. Thanks so much, Nazia. Um, so that was for um, some very uh, common themes um, amongst those, um, but also I think um, when talking about the different roles and responsibilities, highlighting that um, the trial manager um, has different roles when it is um, a trial manager working for a sponsor uh, organization. Um, some things in the chat about when would um, TMs be involved in, in budgeting and and um, IMP shipments and things. So the the difference between, um, although it's the same job title, I think it can be very different depending on, on which trial you're working on and which setting you're working in. Um, I have a, a few things that I'd like to ask the panel and we're also going to try and um, adopt, um, bring in some of the questions from the Q&A. Um, we'll try and answer these as well on, online. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask to the panel was um, in in your bios, we also touched on things that um, your your previous roles before being a clinical trial manager. And I just wanted to see what you thought would be your most sort of transferable uh, skill from your previous role that was important um, when um, becoming a trial manager. Which What do you feel were your most important transferable skills? Um, anybody, I can pick someone or uh, just volunteer. Who wants to go first? Um, uh, Pete, I've got to you. Yeah, thank you. I think it's it's some of the things that I mentioned in my slides as well for transferable skills. And I know not everyone can maybe have these, but for me personally is work man you know starting off in the lab or working let's say in a pharmacy and all these things they really help afterwards see how as but let's say if you do have a trial that manages samples how to do that um but other than that is what a lot most of my colleagues mention is being able to not multitask but just be responsible for a lot of different things and have um as we say in the uk your your fingers in a lot of different pies just be be able to do a lot of different things so even if you can grab something from every single thing even just a little to just get you started i would say that's yeah that'd be helpful thanks peter i agree with peter that um because not on um um, people can have the appropriate background with the trial because we had to, uh, um, we had to work with the very various diverse uh, clinical trials. So I agree with Peter that we should, um, yeah, not multiple tasks as you mentioned, Peter, but we can take them the role in each um step of the trial to understand that. For example, when I start, I'm background in biology, um. But I don't very uh, well familiar with how to batch a sample in very um high risk of uh, BSL three sample. So I have to learn from each step, and we we can learn from that, and we can get experience by working in that or shadowing someone that, and we can get the um, knowledge and experience. That's what my thought. Thanks, Nog. Okay. Um. 
Um, yeah. And <clears throat> sorry. Sorry, Anna. If I could also add. Yes. Just, sorry, um, yeah. I think working um, initially in clinical trials as a research nurse was very useful for me because um, I was involved in the data collection, uh, working closely with um, pharmacy lab data, clinic flows, understanding clinic flows, and at times uh, being in a leadership uh, role in the clinic, um, supervising staff when the manager was away. Um, that, uh, that really helped when I went up into trial management because I understood the flow of the clinic and the challenges and the issues. So it was easy to identify with the team when they are having challenges in a certain area. So you could assist uh, and also even be able to have yeah, just that insight of how the whole system functions. I think that found that very useful. Yeah. Thanks. And there's some, some questions coming up about sort of backgrounds. And I think I think we've shown just from, from this panel that um, you can come into the role of clinical trial manager from a number of backgrounds, whether it's um, sort of nursing or being in the pharmacy or, or the lab. Um, so I think, um, yeah, and there are a lot of um, training courses and experience, especially if, if people have opportunity to go to the, um, the MRCCTU and Global Health Network Hub. Um, there are a lot of resource, resources on there in terms of um, um, different uh, tools and templates and, and different training opportunities um, within clinical trials. Um, the next question I'd like to ask to the panel is um, about the sort of the challenges of working in, in global trials. And so I think um, you all touched on one of the challenges is sort of uh, making sure you're aware of all the um, regulations and requirements within all the countries that you're working in, and and also that those um, requirement requirements might be updated and changed. And I just wondered if you had any tips for um, keeping on top of, of of those changes and what the the requirements are, and communicating those within within your teams. Hi, Anna. Uh, so, yeah, so I think it is very challenging because I think, as Peter mentioned in his presentation, sometimes you think you're aware of the requirements, then throughout the trial, uh, another site will say, oh, we haven't actually submitted this, or we've done this submission, but you weren't aware that it was required initially. Uh, so I think kind of having a spreadsheet or some kind of tracker uh, where you can keep a track of all the submissions that are required uh, can help. And I think also speaking to sister trials within the unit. So, for example, we have other trials that are similar to D3, uh, which we liaise with so that we know if they've reported that some kind of submission is required, then we're aware of that too. So I think having that communication within the unit and just uh, feeding this back to your TMT or your TMG and uh, discussing these at regular meetings uh, can also be quite helpful. Thank you. I wanted to add to that, Anna. So I completely agree yeah. with tracker and everything. Sometimes it helps when you're doing your annual progress reports or safety reports to go check before, because each, each let's say, competent authority might require a new, um, sorry, their own form to, let's say, submit these reports. Um, and using the tracker that Nazia mentioned, it's useful to see, have, have there been any updates before you speak? that you're aware of when um, you do something differently, make something new. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, for me that, um, yeah, I mentioned about the regulation and the degree. So um, recently Vietnam had the very new degree on how to protect the data for the, the patient or enrolled in the trial. So I think that the first one, how can we keep up that um, that information we can uh, communicate with the governance team to get information and the other thing that we surprise on the, the law um, system that we can receive the information on time so that the, the way that how can we keep us um, up to date for the information and also the degrees or the laws relating to the clinical trials yeah that's my experience on that thank you maybe um, Oh, sorry. Sorry, Anna. No, go on, Annie, please. Um, from a side perspective, um, working also with different sponsors and keeping up to date with uh, the different requirements.
can actually be a very good learning experience because different sponsors have different requirements and they can actually capacitate your team to be able to work uh, in, in global um, studies. So it, it's actually quite a good thing, but uh, to keep on top of things with the different sponsors, it's important, um, yes, to have a tracker, to be able to capture what each one wants, but so that they get the attention they need, it's also important to have focus individuals within your team who ensure that the needs of each one are taken care of. Thanks. Yeah, because I think um, across all four panelists, you've got trial managers who are working on one trial, but in multiple countries. And then we've got trial managers who are working in one country, but with multiple protocols. So I think that um, they both take quite a lot of, of, of juggling. Um, and so, so, so one of the questions in, in the chat is about any sort of uh, management tools or, or software that, that um, you use to, to keep on, you know, to try and keep all these processes on track. I don't know if anybody has any uh, recommendations on anything that they, they use. Um, so currently, our Opera use the study line. So study line is the system that we can uh, track everything um, from the, the setup phase for the IRB submission. And then the BI can check on that and give the real life for the study staff. And um, during the ongoing phase, we can check about the um, study recruitment, the, the monitoring visits. So everything is keep on track on that. So that system called the study line. So I can text on them the chat and you can share it for them. Yeah. That'd be really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> okay. We we came up um with the sort of like a, a Gantt chart, but we tailor made it to be able to flag for us when each protocol expires and when you should initiate re uh, renewals. So we need about three to four months before it actually expires because we have several layers to go through before you get all your approvals in. So we found that very useful. And on that tool, you can then insert study timelines when this one starts and ends so that when you're approaching the final year, you are able to seek extension with your ethics and reg before it actually runs out of that time. So because you'll have lots of protocols to juggle, we found it very useful. Um, and even study reference numbers with ethics and regs. And then you can put in an activity column to say what's happening with each protocol when you have your weekly meetings where you discuss um, reg issues, which is quite important when you have multiple trials to set aside time just to talk about reg. Thank you. Okay. Um, and another question from the, the Q&A is, um, and I think this is something that all trial managers, um, maybe, you know, it's always the bottom of the pile. Um, how do you, have you got any tips for maintaining your ETMF or your paper TMF, or your study folders, sort of keeping on top of that sort of administrative um, filing? Um, any tips for, for keeping on top of that? Um, I would say, I, I did give an answer to one of you, there might be multiple. Um, my suggestion was maybe give yourself about an hour every week. Um, if you start with an index at the beginning of the trial, um, give yourself about an hour every week to update it, whether that it's it's a folded like to print and put in the paper TMF, it's the, it's the ETMF to just update and move those files over. Doing it maybe weekly, helps you keep on top and even if you don't it's still you know rather than two months later you see that pile and you're like what do i do where do i start thanks peter what well, we um we we keep um electronic um folders that mirror the hard copy folders so that when most documents will come over email so if you don't have time to file it immediately, you make sure that you slot it into the correct folder that matches the hard copy folder. So when, uh, like uh, Peter said, you have that one day or one hour a week, you can then cross check and print off and print in the in the hard in the hard copy folder. Because sometimes when you look for the document in your emails, it might might be tricky to find. 
So that's that's one way of 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 um of doing it that we have found works, and also just making sure that your inbox is also divided into different protocols so that certain emails from certain groups go into certain inboxes. Then it's easier to find documents to file off. Thanks. I was just going to add to that, that. I think also sometimes maybe having a rotor, if you if your team allows, if you've got a few more trial managers or data managers, maybe splitting it between yourself so that the responsibility doesn't fall on one person and you can share it out uh, maybe on a weekly basis uh, so that different people are responsible at different times and it doesn't, yeah, as I said, it doesn't fall on one person who then might not have the time to constantly update it. That's good, yeah, sharing responsibility. Right. Um, and then another question um, was, how do you sort of um, balance kind of being in charge versus because um, you're managing a lot of people sort of directing? Um, um, I'll just repeat that question. If I'm back, if people can hear me, um, just um, how do you manage sort of uh, when to be um, in charge and, and and directing within your team, and and when um, you may need to to ask for help on something? Other questions. Uh, we can move on to something else then. I think maybe if you're confident in that area. Uh, then you know you you'll have the confidence to take charge on it uh, so for example if you're quite familiar with pharmacy and IMP uh, and there are tasks related to that or queries then you kind of have the independence to lead on that whereas if there are areas of the trial that you're not as familiar with or you know that there are other members of your team such as the data managers uh, who have a better knowledge of it then I think it's fine to ask for their help or even ask a clinical project manager who has overall oversight um, for help it, I guess it depends on your strengths and weaknesses and how well you know each aspect of the trial. I, I think that we, um, there is a relation between being in chat and also asking for help because when we being in chat, we can aware about the issue and about the problem or the task that we are taking. So if we we don't have any idea how to solve that, we can asking for help to solve the problem. So it's also the thing that I mentioned in my slide that we should have a problem solving skill, not not solving that independently, which we should we should don't be afraid to discuss and ask the other team to have a solution because overall we just want to solve a problem and bring the better things for the trial. So just be aware and then we asking for help if we don't know. I think that's key, isn't it? No, knowing when to ask and, and, and who to ask. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, many times um, we have had to call on the PI to say, um, we need help here. Um, depending on who the stakeholder is that you're dealing with at that time. Because sometimes there are some decisions that need to be made beyond your level as trial manager. So it's important to know um, those differences and ask for help and ask them to chip in and assist. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. And there's quite, quite a few questions coming up about um, any sort of specific qualifications um, to, to become a trial manager. And I think we've sort of, we've touched on this already, but sort of um, we've had uh, people with, with, with nursing, uh, medical or medical backgrounds, and but also um, sort of scientific lab based backgrounds um as well um that's um from from what the uh, the panel have um i think we've got time for just a couple more um questions um sorry when i cut out the q a chat um cut out as well but um i'll just try and see if there's um so one of the questions was sort of about, and I, any, I think you've already sort of slightly touched on it. It's sort of how do you deal with um, engaging the PI and the CI and sort of getting um, the time you need from them um, to be able to to do your your role as trial manager. Yeah, 
because we've we've had a session on PIs and I know that uh, they're usually very very busy. So trying to um, how do you get you know their their time to be able to or their engagement or, and re retaining their oversight of the, the studies. Um, so what we found helpful is right uh, when the study is starting, say you are starting to work with a PI for the first time or you've been working with them before, but the study is starting is to establish some um, work ethic, I mean, work ground rules, I might call them, uh, for lack of a better word, but um, to agree with the PI uh, whether you need time to sit um, per week or they are the kind of PI who prefers you to just give them a call or send a WhatsApp or a text message. Indeed, uh, some PIs uh, also are lecturers at universities or they have got other commitments with participants or patients. So um, they are not always free. So one needs to work around with them. Uh, what helps us is that we have a weekly team meeting with the whole team. But that's an opportunity when after the meeting, you can always ask them to say, I have a few things that I need to run by you. Or in advance, you can tell them that, look, when you come for the weekly meeting, I also need time uh, to discuss with you. Um, and some PIs are, are, are good. They always make themselves available by, you, you know, they're at a specific time for a certain period. So you know that if there's something that has come up, you can just go over and, and catch up with them. So yeah, it, it, it's about negotiating and discussing it openly and then you establish timelines on when you can meet. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. And I think um just just one final question before we sort of go to the closing remarks, um, that I can see as a common theme as well. Um um, and it would may possibly be a different approach for the trial managers who are um, sort of based at the sponsor versus ones who are sort of on the ground with the, the clinical sites. But how do you sort of um, retain um, the momentum with, with re re recruitment and, um, and retention of, of patients within, within clinical trials? Um, so what we have found useful is um, to engage constantly the outreach team um, together with the rest of the team, but more the outreach team um, when they have challenges. We, we have um, created like a pre-screening log, which they use to identify potential participants. So whenever they screen out a patient, we, we walk through those reasons why you have screened out a particular patient. And then we iron it out to say if there's a way to go around it. Um, for example, we had issues with birth certificates. Uh, so we need to know the date of birth and the age and some children don't have those. So we worked out um, a way with the team to say, look, um, I think some of our team uh, knew people from the registry offices one of our PIs linked us up with them. So we're able to assist some of those participants to get those birth certificates. So those are so it's important basically to just keep in touch and know reasons why they are screening out. And once you know those reasons and you iron them out, you find that you can actually increase momentum. And sometimes there is need for them to go beyond the catchment area that they've been going to. So as trial manager, you also want to assist in lobbying for them to get extra resources to be able to go further. And sometimes they require uh, station permissions. So you are doing the letters to the relevant uh, provincial medical directors or regional units so that they can go that far. So you support them. So during the recruitment phase, it's important to stay very tight with your recruitment outreach team as a whole, yeah. And that's what I can contribute. Thank you. I also want to share my experience about the patient, um, patient recruitment. So yes, I agree that we should have the pre-screening log that we can identify what is the reason for failure in going to study. And the other thing that we should think about um, maybe the ICF formatting because I, I did have a small project to identify 
is it the ICF to communicate it to the patient or not? What what about the wording that we use in the ICF? And we found out that there's something that it will make the participant consider about our study, not about the safety of the drug or the schedule for the follow-up visit, but about the ICF is too complicated and they, they don't understand anything about the study. So this is also the reason that they don't want to go in the our study. So I think being a trial manager, we should think very um diversely. So in the point of um the patient, how why they can um um uh, fail in the study movement because of the um ineligible criteria, but also think about the ICF or what is the tool that we can um get in touch with the patient and how can we enroll them in the study. So that's also the thing that we should Think about it. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much. Well, thank you to all four of our panelists um, today. I think there's been um, some great themes on um, sort of the different backgrounds that people have come from to end up in the, the role of um, clinical trial manager. Um, there's a, a, a lot of um, discussion on um, building the um, good relationships and coordinating the, the team and, and maintaining those relationships throughout the study. Um, sort of the, the whole thing of being a multifunctional, uh, just all the different things that um, that you are coordinating at the same time. And I think uh, we're just going to put up a, a final slide with them. Um, some of the um, resources that we've got and also the um, top the top tips um, from each of the panelists so um, if we could share those slides that would be great thank you so these are just the sort of I think the, the top tips and um, I've added one in of my own as well so um, so it's it's okay um, to that we don't get everything correct from the beginning because there, there are always ways of amending your processes that you've developed and you can amend protocols through the, the, the right processes um, and to maintain um, cordial relationships. That's obviously, I think that has been a key theme across all, all of your presentations and um, to manage your, your workload and stress uh, and to be a good communicator, problem solver um, and have good trial management. Um, and I think that the final top tip would, with me would be that it, it's okay to not know all the answers. Um, every protocol, every trial is different. There's going to be new challenges coming up with every uh, new trial that you do. So I think it, it's about knowing what to ask uh, and who to ask to go to for help, because essentially we are all part of um, a big team science when it comes to clinical trials we're, we're huge teams of people and, and the trial manager is usually the one coordinating all of those different elements so um it's yeah a lot a lot of teamwork but um there are some this uh, webinar will be made available um and the, just to say if um people are interested in finding out more about the tools and templates um, and the trainings um, that are available, then please do visit the MRC CTU um, hub um, that's coordinated with the, the Global Health, ne Health Network. But um, thank you very much um, for joining us today and thank you for all your questions. We'll try and get as many of those answered. Thank you. <laughs>